Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. The Threat Connect platform enables organizations to identify, manage, and block threats faster with threat intelligence, automation, and orchestration. Providing security teams a platform to unite their people, processes, and technologies behind an intelligence-driven defense. Threat Connect helps increase visibility into networks and integrates with defense tools to close the gap between threat detection and response. Get your free Threat Connect account today by visiting threatconnect.com forward slash security weekly. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never before seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries at the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame, automate the hunt. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. We have a very special guest to deliver our technical segment for this evening. Jimmy Mesta is going to talk about containerizing your security operations. Jimmy's an application security leader that has been involved in information security for 10 years. He is the chapter leader of OWASP Santa Barbara and co-organizer of the AppSec California Security Conference. He spent time on both offense and defense side of the industry and is constantly working towards building modern, developer-friendly security solutions. Jimmy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. It's good to be here. So, Jimmy, do you you work today uh, as a developer or more on the security side? Or uh, I am a security engineer at a software company, so okay. software as a service uh, called Invoca, and we have a call intelligence platform that people use, so a bunch of SIP and call routing and a big uh, giant Rails application, so defending that and making our customers happy. Nice. Very nice. cool. So do you most of your development in, in Ruby or... Uh, yes, now uh, Python previously. So, uh, <laughs> I gotcha. how was that? How has that transition yeah. been for you? Uh, not too bad, actually. I've grown to really kind of enjoy Ruby and, and Rails specifically. Uh, came from Django and Flask, and they're kind of interchangeable, but mm-hmm. the syntax is just something you have to get used to. Absolutely, right. yeah. For right. me, like attempting to program program in Ruby is like trying to speak in French, because the the conjugation and the the order of where your verbs and your nouns go is completely backwards. Yeah, or, or it at least seems like it is to me. <clears throat> so, it, yep. is Flask something you recommend for like smaller <clears throat> applications? Because I've dabbled in it. And we have a couple of applications. One that I wrote, and one that someone else wrote in Flask. Yeah, no, I, I I love those micro frameworks just to get things off the ground, especially if it's an API. Uh, there's no need for the, the big ecosystem that is Django. You I don't gotcha. actually need those features. So Sinatra is the Ruby version of Flask, if you will, and mm-hmm. that's very easy to get started too. Nice. Awesome. <clears throat> so tell us about containerizing your security operations center, Jimmy. Sure. Yeah. So um, I gave a talk at AppSec USA uh, a few months back on some work we've been doing here uh, around basically putting containers in production that are security specific. So we've rolled out a Kubernetes cluster um, and we're rolling our production infrastructure onto that and Docker in general. So it was a good opportunity for me as a security engineer to start porting some of my tools over that I use day to day. uh, for IDS, IPS, kind of OSSEC, and some other ones into Kubernetes, Dockerizing it, and um, so what is Kubernetes? making it a little what? more portable. I'm sorry, Jimmy. What is Kubernetes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to go yeah. defer him to the Circle CI <laughs> blog and tell him to read that one oh, as to what yeah. Kubernetes well, is. <laughs> uh, I, I only have 15 minutes, but um, <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, is that that article that was they wrote about uh, containerization that was yes. like really uh, like a duck like pun on the whole, like making fun of the whole thing? Well, it's not so much making fun of it as partially true. I gotcha. I think, but so, we'll, we'll, yeah. I'll defer to my I'll defer to our guest on that one. Yeah. So, so you have Docker. You want to write a container. You want to run the container in your laptop or on a server. That's fine. Uh, the minute you want to get that into production in some sort of of manner that actually scales and is resilient, uh, you have to look into some orchestration tool. And Kubernetes is gotcha. one of them. It's built. It's open sourced by Google. It's part of Borg, which was their container orchestration infrastructure. Um, it's just a way to get Docker containers out into the world and actually usable uh, 
with kind of abstracting it away from from infrastructure and servers and things like that. That was the one so, where, like, I need Docker, and then Docker has containers. I need to organize right. containers. I need to orchestrate them. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, you got to right. orchestrate them. I yeah. gotcha. <laughs> yeah, with a bunch of microservices, and each one of them can, each one of your microservices <laughs> can use an API to retrieve the. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I laughed my ass off at that article. That I know the article you're talking about, and that is part of it is very true. Um, <laughs> I got you. It's, it, it's is, a it is a, it's it a is overly that never ends. It is overly com complex at at the beginning, right? And I think we're now kind of seeing security folks such as yourselves adopt this technology Absolutely. more and more. And, and I, yeah, okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, as I, I'm I'm adopting it because. I have to, and that's our infrastructure, and I'd rather learn it in detail than be stuck behind uh, before. I mean, our developers are going that way anyway, so I might as well embrace it. Embrace Absolutely. change. If I was the first company I ever worked for. Embrace change, the CEO used to say. <laughs> Let me show you how we... No, no, uh, uh, nope. Almost said something, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Not going to. Jimmy, please continue. <laughs> yes, please, oh, Jimmy. Okay. Just, just don't okay. make it a so, grunt. So um, I was going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes and some of the tools that Sweet. I've, been, I've been using in Kubernetes uh, and Docker uh, as well. Uh, this is a very condensed version of the talk I gave. Uh, and really it comes down to I'm, I'm a defender now, if you will, and I have to build these things to scale out to the company. There's one of me and 40 other engineers here. Uh, so I want to make sure that everybody has access to all the interesting security tools that I get to play with every day. And Docker has helped me do that. Um, and so Metasploit, for example, is one of those things I've always had a hard time when a developer comes up and wants to hack around on Metasploit, like getting it installed on OSX is a bit of a burden and they're, they're easily distracted and we'll just not do it and never, never continue down that path. So we, you know, you put a Docker container out there of a tool, it's one line and they can start actually using it. So that's kind of what kickstarted this whole thing uh, in my mind. And it's become very, very helpful just spreading the, the word of security around the office. Um, <coughs> go ahead. No, so I, I was just going to say, um, uh, I, I ex personally experienced Docker um, <clears throat> in that you can take uh, somewhat complex tools. Like we have Security Onion, right? Mm -hmm. You can take the, some of the individual tools and Dockerize them and put them out there and let them uh, listen to traffic. And almost like you can create its own network within it. Um, and I think that enables people to start playing around with some of these more individual tools rather than getting a full distribution and having to deal with all them at once. You can kind of containerize it, as it were. Yeah, exactly. And and it's a little more safe for your resources, like spinning up a virtual machine with Kali Linux and that whole process is, is fine and it works great. But if you just want to use one tool and you don't want virtual box and all of the burden that comes with virtual machines, you can just use Docker. And then you can take that same image and drop it into Kubernetes or your orchestration tool of choice. And then you have it running on a server somewhere where everybody else can interact with it. Uh, we did, I did that with uh, Metasploit um, Armitage. Basically, you could set up your own team server and it's all in Docker and you can pass the Docker container around if somebody wants to mess with it. So it's just as an easy portable way to make sure you're getting immutable infrastructure that doesn't take a lot of like hand holding and you have to SSH to it and update everything. It's a, kind of a one liner. Yeah, so how is the update? So let's say you've got a Docker container with Metasploit that you've got a bunch of people using in your environment and you create a new one. Like, how does that, how does that get updated without blowing away the user data that people might be creating within their Docker containers? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's sort of where orchestration comes into the, to, to the discussion because um, you're looking at persistent data. And for example, we're running OSSEC. Um, if, you know, it's basically IDS, IPS, FIM sort of tool, if, if you're not familiar, but most people are. So we have sensors reporting back to OSSEC, which is running in Docker um, on Kubernetes. And then we have a mounted shared persistent disk. So at any given moment, we can have three or four Docker containers running OSSEC talking to this database. We can scale out 
pretty much instantly. And then if the server gets blown away or all the containers go away, we have that data stored on disk and the next container that comes up just just attaches to it and it moves right along. Uh, so that's kind of what you need a Kubernetes solution for. You can do it in Docker, uh, just mounting in the file system or other disks, but it, it really is nice to have that, um, that orchestration layer on top of it. <clears throat> so are you, I'm assuming you're using it for defensive tools as well as offensive tools? Yeah. Um, most, I mean, mostly defensive tools here and some training tools as well. Well, I'll spin up WebGoat and vulnerable applications. Uh, I have a, a little demo to go through as well and make sure we have enough time uh, just to, to give to give the listeners kind of a feel for what a, a Kubernetes config file looks like and, and how you interact with a uh, Kubernetes cluster and how easy it is to scale out. Yeah, let's do that. Let's see the let's see the demo. As much as I may may want to make fun of Kubernetes and orchestration and all this stuff, this is fascinating. <laughs> and I need, it is, and, I, and I need to embrace the change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is um, a really at first it's like learning a totally new language. Um, it took me a, quite a while to to grasp the concepts in Kubernetes, but once you're there, uh, it is a pretty powerful tool and. And that's you know I, that's where people are going now, and security experts are kind of I haven't met too many who are focused on Kubernetes, and this is what people are running at banks and insurance companies and, and big time enterprises now. So we'll see. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's make sure things are working here. All right, can you see this? Yeah, just make it bigger, yep. please. A little bigger? All yeah. right. All right. So. Even bigger. Ah, that's good. Okay. There you go. Okay. Let me go one down. All oh, right. Perfect. So, briefly, um, the, the, the kind of premise of the talk I gave was was around your security operations center. So, I put together some, this basically just the open source GitHub repo, called it CloudSock. Uh, this is, these are all Kubernetes configs that run specific security tools. So, if you go down here, KubeBot is just a little uh, utility tool. It's not really a security tool, but it lets you interact with your cluster in Slack. But um, so you're looking at the yeah, I've Metasploit, Scumbler, which is a open source Netflix tool, which kind of goes and scours the internet for for keywords and things like that. It's a defensive tool. Uh, ThreadFix, which vulnerability aggregation and reporting tool. Uh, WebGoat uh, from OWASP, which is just just basically a vulnerable. Uh, web application used for training and kind of lessons and things. Uh, and for fun, I put a uh, Zap UI here, which is this really horrid Java over the web sort of container that runs, but it, it works um, pretty well. And Zap is an intercepting proxy. So since uh, some people are probably familiar with WebGoat, and that's the easiest one to demo right now, I was just going to go down and, and briefly show show you what a, a Kubernetes config looks like and how to deploy it into a Kubernetes um, cluster that I have running in uh, Google Cloud right now. It's just, it's one, it's a one virtual machine cluster. It's nothing major, but I just use it for testing. So in Kubernetes, you have the, the these different, con you're basically turning YAML into um, a deployment object in Kubernetes. And that's all it boils down to. So there's different types of objects you can deploy. One is a, is a pod, and within a pod, and these these terms are going to sound Wait, maybe utter, utterly is a, ridiculous. Is a pod <laughs> is a pod a collection of containers or a collection? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yes, gotcha. So a pod is the smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes. So if you want to deploy one container, um, it will be in a pod in Kubernetes land, and uh, and once you do that, you're basically running a container on a cluster, which can be one virtual machine or a thousand. And you have a controller that'll basically pick uh, one of the machines that has space and memory uh, to actually run it. And and then you have your container running. So and to hold get, on, Jimmy. I, I, I have ahead. a question just to set some context for our listeners. So um, I could have multiple <clears throat> sets of security tools for different purposes. Um, I could define different pods, right? And then as I go through my job, I can say, well, 
I need like this set of software essentially to run on, on this system. Like maybe it's a, a bro sensor with some extensions and then, well, I want to yep. set up a, a lab uh, for web application testing and then I've got a collection of containers that I deploy in a pod. So it sounds like it's going to, once you spend the time to develop and implement it and learn it, that w it will easily allow you to deploy your tools either offense or, uh, or defense software uh, without defi your environment. Software-defined virtualization. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the use, but that's the use case, yeah. right? Well, that's and, the use case. and networking too. Yeah, you'll, you'll, there's a networking layer. I'll, I'll dive into in a minute. Um, but you got it. That's exactly it. Okay. It's it's basically a, a pod is a collection of containers that share the, um, the same, basically the same IP address. So you can have multiple pods that all, can all talk to each other. But you'll see in this example, this is a, a single container in one pod. Um, and, and here you're looking at some YAML. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, and you wouldn't ever want to have just a singular pod living in a Kubernetes cluster. Or if it, because pods can kind of die and go away and come, be brought back up. And then they're, they're kind of transient. So you want it to be a, ver a type uh, kind deployment. And what this means is you're basically telling Kubernetes, hey, look at this replica line and make sure you always have one of these running at any given time. So that's really useful because if you have a three node cluster and one of the nodes goes down, Kubernetes will say, if this pod was on it, it'll bring it back up on another one immediately after that. So, so you get that redundancy and the, the high availability there. And that's less important with like a security tool you use every once in a while. But if you're actually, you know, putting a service out there for people to use, you want it to be available. Right. Now, so, now how, does it, how does something like that handle failure during, during use? Let's say I've got uh, a team server set up. I've got a bunch of stuff connected to it. And one of those machines goes down and it migrates uh you will notice a little bit of downtime slightly uh just because it's got to bring up the pod onto another <clears throat> virtual machine i guess but hopefully if you have a, a service that actually you know people are hammering on you would just scale this replica up from the get-go to about three okay or, but it but it maintain, but it maintains state between down yep. and up Yep, it'll maintain state. Uh, it's it's fully load fully load balanced. Cool, interesting. Um, so we're looking here. We have one replica. That means I want to spin up one of these pods at any given time, and I'm just going to give it some very simple labels. These are user defined uh, key value pairs, and this is how other pods can talk to it. And then we have the kind of the meat of this right here is is the container. So the name. This is defined by me. I want to call it WebGoat. But this image is, is straight from Docker Hub. So this isn't my uh, Docker container. This, this is M, Mr. Mendez. And uh, I'm, what I'm telling Kubernetes is basically saying, hey, go to Docker Hub and grab this and then expose port 8080 on the container because that's what WebGoat talks on. That's all fine um, until you actually need to access this thing from elsewhere. So I want to open it up to the web um, I, because right now it's just going to get an internal IP address with port 8080. And that's, that's okay uh, if you are only talking to internal nodes. But this is where the, the Kubernetes service type comes in. And uh, a service is what lets us talk to this container from either the outside world or, or just the inside as an internal API. This one in particular opens up um, port 8080 on a load balancer because I've, I've defined uh, the type load balancer here. So it'll open up port 8080 and in Google Cloud or AWS or your cloud of choice will actually spin up an, an ELB or, or a load balancer, open port 8080, and you have your, your load balancing done automatically there. So well, well, that's could, Yeah, I mean, that's not really a... A security tool thing, right? That's I'm deploying infrastructure, and I want to deploy a new service, and I want to have multiple instances across different areas yep. of my <clears throat> virtual cloud, so to speak, right? Exactly. It's it's it, it, there are security implications here, uh, and we'll see as soon as I spin this up. I will quickly take it down because it's a vulnerable web application. <laughs> it's web boat, right? <laughs> running <laughs> running on my own. Uh, it's just a throwaway cluster, but. Um, 
but and I just wanted to demonstrate the the ease to to actually once you have this YAML written, uh, things can grow a little bit. Uh, you know, the Metasploit one isn't really much more complex. Mm -hmm. uh, thread thread fix is though because there's a lot of persistence in in thread fix. That's it, you're uploading. Uh, scan reports and things like that, and I want to save those to MySQL, and I have um, a persistent disk on the back end. So this one, this one's got a bit more going on uh, when, and I'm giving it, you know, CPU, and but you can go way down the the rabbit hole with this. But um, this is the kind of stuff you end up writing in in a production environment. So I'm just gonna interact with. Uh, I'm in the WebGoat directory, and I'm going to interact with my Kubernetes cluster. So this is in Google Cloud. Um, so kubectl is, is how you interact with this, and it's super simple to set up. Um, right now, I don't have any pods running. Um, and I have one service, probably. Yeah, so this is the Kubernetes service that comes with the cluster itself. So the cool thing is uh, to create, to actually go and deploy my pods and services and all these things, it's all done through the command line in this directory. Ultra simple, and you can you could throw this in a script if you want. So you can automate a lot of this stuff, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, we're not sitting and creating these one by one. So what this is going to do is just going to take the files in this directory and, and basically go ahead and, and tell the Kubernetes controller to create a deployment and a service. And when I look now, if I have any pods running, um, I have one because I told it I want one. And this means there's one WebGoat container running on my Kubernetes cluster. And, and services, you can see here, there is... This new web webgoat service has a cluster IP. This is internal and an external IP that is pending. This means it's telling Google Cloud go spin up a load balancer and let's let's open this thing up to, to the rest of the internet so it can get hacked in about 0.3 seconds. So I'm just going to give it a second to spin up a load balancer um, and open up that port. But in the meantime. Um, there is a notion of secrets as well. I just wanted to touch on briefly since we're talking security. Uh, mm. the, the, secret, the secrets are a necessary part of any web application. Uh, and Kubernetes has its own secret type. Uh, this, is a, this is a dummy one. This is checked into the repo. But basically, you have to handle them uh, a little precariously because they're just base64 encoded values. You don't want to check them into any sort of, of repository, and you want to run this so the secrets will get deployed and then mounted into the pod that needs it. Uh, it, it works pretty well, but there is a little bit of tiptoeing you have to do around secrets and the deployment of secrets, and you can easily plug them into environment variables and things like that into your containers. There are some integrations uh, coming down the pipe with, with tools like console and things like that. But I just figured I'd add there is a the capability to include secrets here as well. And so we're up. And you can see WebGoat now has a public IP. And... So with any, with any luck, yeah. So um, this this just spun, this spun up a, a one container with WebGoat running on a server in Google Cloud with one command. Pretty useful. This is a very simple example, obviously. But as you scale this out and start getting some of these tools off your laptop, you can like ThreadFix and OSSEC have really helped us to to be able to scale out like this because we're looking at. 150 servers talking back to ThreadFix, so I can say, hey, I need six, six OSSEC receivers at any given time to take these alerts and do things with them. Um, and that's been really uh, high performance for us. Uh, there's some bumps along the way, but um, 
but yeah, it's just another tool to keep in mind uh, as you're building building out your your own little internal security team and, and all all the scripting around it. So d- dumb question, uh, yep. and and uh, thinking you talked about dropping uh, Metasploit in uh, a, a container. Now, if you're dropping said container at some place like AWS. How would you have that container be on your internal network for interacting with, say, internal resources, as opposed to publicly available? Yes, that's that's a, a great question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I, in when you're using Kubernetes, you're you're going to have internal. You're probably going to do it in a VPC in AWS. I would assume. Um, hopefully, you wouldn't put it in like a public subnet. I just wouldn't create a load balancer type um, in this service here. So what that'll what that'll do if you just keep it as an internal IP, it'll it'll expose it to the IP address of the machine that's running um, the Metasploit container. So all of your internal, you know, ten dot or whatever can talk to it. This range here. Mm-hmm. That's provisioned by Kubernetes, but nobody else can. And we do that for internal APIs quite often. Uh, we don't actually spin up load balancers, not much at all, really. Uh, only when you need that that web interface to it. But yeah, that's a great question. Then you would have to either VPN in or have some kind of jump box or something. But that that works just fine in in Kubernetes. It's actually probably easier and cheaper because load balancers cost whatever thirteen bucks a pop from Amazon. <clears throat> yep. Now, conceivably, you could put this on like a uh, on some OS internally, as opposed to at AWS. Yep. Um, Kubernetes will run really anywhere. And the, the last thing I wanted to mention was um, a tool called Minikube, which, if you're if if any listeners want to to experiment with Kubernetes, um, Minikube is a new ish uh, tool set from uh, Kubernetes world that actually lets you run it on like a vagrant VM or, or on virtual box. It's just a one node cluster that you interact with um, from your laptop and it stays local. And you can, you can do that to kind of get your, get your feet wet, or you can just spin up a bare metal. You can have a rack sitting somewhere and just, just there's install scripts to get Kubernetes running um, almost entirely on any any sort of hardware you can imagine. Excellent. <clears throat> so you're running your own sort of essentially private cloud at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, then, by the, and, and for the rec- record, uh, Minikube is cube with a K. Yes. Yes. Every, everything's with a K in cu- Kubernetes land. So um, then you'll get sick of saying the word Kubernetes once you work. <laughs> you said it a lot. It. Yeah. If we were to play a drinking game, if you listen to this segment, segment. we should have already uh, said it in the beginning. Kubernetes. I'm sorry. Container. Sorry. It's the future. <laughs> Drink on Kubernetes container and pod. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be pretty lit. By the end. <laughs> Sound, sounds so futuristic. Um, yeah, so, and, and, and other cloud providers have this sort of functionality for orchestrating containers as well. Like East, Amazon has uh, their container service, and there's Mesos Marathon, and there's all these other ones. But this is just the one I know, and I've, I've had a pretty good experience with it so far. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Awesome. <clears throat> well, that was a lot of <clears throat> new terms. <laughs> it, it, it's it's, it's <clears throat> mind acronyms. Blo- it's mind blowing. And it was and mind blown. I, I think for me, humor is the way you deal with something that uh, that you don't understand or have frustration. You gotta send me a link to that article again, Larry. Uh, you need to put that in Slack and, or uh, or text it to me or yeah. send it to me on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. Yeah, we were having yeah. not yeah. instant messenger. We don't. We decided that yeah, it's done. out. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Google Hangouts. So, and so hopefully everybody was playing buzzword bingo during this, and I and I said a few buzzwords for you know Docker containers. So pod, it's always always fun. Post to us. I didn't say cyber. <laughs> not a whole lot of cyber. Not a whole lot of security. Well, Jimmy, thank you very much for coming on Security Weekly. Uh, that's, and that's, <laughs> this is awesome. I mean, I, I, I'm resistant to change. You know, humans are naturally resistant. Embrace to change. change. And and quite honestly, this is now one of those things that I need some spare time to go play with. <clears throat> any any questions? I can 
I can send you guys some some articles and some things that helped me along the way, uh, or I'm up to chat about it anytime. I have uh, I have a talk on it, so I'm I'm into it. I'll rant about Docker and Jimmy, those things all day. I have I have a question. How do, does Larry and I get more spare time? <laughs> Well, is there like a Docker container yeah, Kubernetes you, for that? <laughs> you could you could containerize your life. Yeah, well, you could it's containerize okay. spare time, but we just sit idle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a special feature in Kubernetes for that actually. So yeah. sold. <laughs> Jimmy, sold. thank you very much for appearing on. Wait, Paul's wait, wait. Here. Do we have to ask some questions? <clears throat> Even though we did do you want to ask them the five time. questions? I, we need to. Sure, we okay. should do it. Larry, 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 do the honors. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, are I'm you drink some water. Are, are you ready for five questions with Security Weekly? Uh, I think so. Let's do it. All right. Three words to describe yourself. Curious and quiet and geeky. I like those. Very much so. If yeah. you were if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A container. <laughs> Kubernetes. Uh, I, um, icicle. An icicle, okay. If yeah. you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? <clears throat> How did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were asking me a question as that was the title, but okay. No, yes, that's perfect. That's, that's it. <laughs> uh, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second. Okay. Okay. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Oh, Johnny Cash would be a decent father. And... Uh, Except for that drug go, phase. Not so much. The whole drug and jail thing. But, you know, <laughs> get over still, that. Still, get over I mean, that's pretty decent. <clears throat> and uh, let's see. And, uh, I would just have a father. All right. This is <laughs> welcome to the late two or the early two thousands, right? Welcome to twenty twenty, almost. Yeah. Oh, it's it's twenty sixteen now, Larry. Right, almost. Soon it'll be twenty seventeen. Twenty twenty <sighs> still three plus years away. All I can say is, in ten days, I will no longer. My age will no longer be the answer to the age, the univer, uh, to the life, universe, and everything. <clears throat> I say you're older than me. I can retire my towel. Wait, no, I can't retire my towel. Again. Fine. Towel. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, <laughs> thank you very much for appearing on uh, Paul Security Weekly. Thank you, Jimmy. <clears throat> Fabulous right. technical Appreciate segment. Appreciate it. Fabulous five question answers. We're going to take a short break and come back. Cheers. Cheers.